So we kind of finished up talking about how paper can have an effect on a drawing as well as the actual drawing tool. Um, and some papers have tooth or a rough surface. And we did look at that piece by Georges Seurat Leeco. Um, so moving on, we're going to talk about dry media. So that includes pencil, charcoal, Conte crown, and pastel. And they each are made of graphite, which is a crystalline form of carbon, and they are available in varying degrees of hardness. So softer pencils give darker lines, and harder pencils give lighter lines, which seems maybe like the opposite, but the softer the pencil it is, the more product will just lay down, and it'll make a darker line. Darkness and the line quality are determined both by the degree of hardness of the pencil and the texture of the drawing surface. So if you have a really texturized drawing surface, that's really going to change the quality of the line. And artists can create a range of values um, with the pressure that they place on that tool as well. So we're going to take a look at States of Mind by Umberto Bocioni. And he kind of used a variety of tools and techniques to create this drawing. States of mind, the farewells. Um, so we see sharp lines, we see strokes made with the side of the charcoal and parallel hatched lines and shaded areas. So, you know, you can see <clears throat> some kind of lines that are creating kind of a cross hatch here, different darknesses and lightnesses to, um, depicted here. And, the sticks of charcoal used today are similar to those that were used by prehistoric peoples, and they're basically charred sticks of wood. And with charcoal, dark areas can be drawn quickly, and it produces a wide range of light to dark values, which is quite, quite nice. And because not all particles of charcoal bind to the surface of the paper, it's really easy to smudge, blur, blur and also erase. So quick changes can be made by erasing, but the finished works will smear pretty easily and become really messy. So that's kind of one of the drawbacks of charcoal as a medium. But you can fix charcoal with a very thin varnish, varnish called a fixative, that's typically just sprayed over the top to keep it in place so it doesn't smudge so easily. And Conte Crown is made from graphite that is mixed with clay and then pressed into sticks. Sorry. So it's all it's, so that it's actually mixed with clay, um, <clears throat> and it can produce varied lines or broad strokes that resist smudging. So it doesn't really smudge as bad as charcoal. Um, George Seurat used Conte Crown to build up the illusion of three-dimensional form and value gradations, which is also called chiaroscuro, um, in his drawing lit echo that we looked at earlier of the child's face. At least we saw the the detail, um, and we'll take another look at that. So this is the actual full piece here. Before we just saw a little detail of the face, but now we can see the actual full piece, the full piece here. And he draws a multitude of lines, yet the final drawing, the individual lines are obscured by the total effect of finely textured light and dark areas. So he's selected Conte Crown on a really rough paper with a lot of tooth, and he really concentrates on the basic forms and on the interplay of light and shadow and using value to create um, mass. So you can see he's, you know, has some really dark areas here. Um, and then some lighter areas like his cheekbone and parts of his arm are quite light. And there's hardly any hatching or um, blending going on here with the Conte crown um, in the lighter areas. So he's really letting the, the paper show through there. And this is from 1883. Um, so We'll talk about pastels. So um, chalk has been around for a while. So red, white, black have been used for since ancient times. But pastels have been produced since about the 17th century. And they have characteristics similar to those of natural chalk. And they have a real purity of color because they're composed of mostly pigment. So basically, like, they, you find a rock in the earth that is a color and you just grind it up. And then you add a little bit of wax to it and press it. And that's basically a pastel. Um, but it's mostly pigment. There's very little binding material. There's a little bit there to actually bind it together and make a stick, but not much. And no drying is actually needed because it's basically all pigment. 
So there's no change in color as they dry, which is kind of a nice little detail about um, pastels. But one thing about them that could be a drawback for some people is that they don't allow for much detail because they're kind of blunt and they force the worker to work really boldly and blending the strokes, you know, you can do that with your fingertip or like a stump of rolled up paper. You can blend it a little bit. Then you can also lightly mix colors that way. And they really achieve the best results when you don't over overwork them or over mix them. You kind of have to leave them really kind of in their organic state. So we're going to look at, at a piece by Degas, Edgar Degas. Le, well, it's actually breakfast after the bath is the English for it. I, I can't speak French, um, but it's called it's breakfast after a bath, basically. And he shifted his attention from oil painting to pastels in his later years. So this is actually from his later years. And he occasionally combined the two in a single work. And he took advantage of the rich colors and subtle blends that were possible with pastels. So he really did like pastel. Um, and they look like, ca this, this composition really looks like a casual um, depiction of everyday life. So basically this woman is just stepped out of the bath and she's drying off. Um, she probably has maybe a, a maid that is kind of attending to her. Um, so the bold contours give a sense of movement to the whole design. And he drew the work in pastels in a coarse fashion. And then the level of detail is not very fine because he did use pastel on this. It's actually quite a big piece. It's 39 inches by 23 inches, basically. Let me check the time on this. Okay, we're still doing good. Keep moving. Sorry about that. So we're going to go into liquid media. So black and brown eggs are the most common drawing liquids, basically. Um, <clears throat> washes of ink are thinned with water. So that's kind of a wash is basically ink um, thinned out with water. <clears throat> Such ink drawings are similar to watercolor, but um, a little different. And felt and fiber tip marker pens are usually... Um, they're actually recent additions to wet media or to the traditional pen and ink um, media that has been around for a long time. Um, so we're going to take a look at a piece by Hokusai, Turning of the Samison. Um, this is a basically a brush drawing. So he's using ink here in a brush, and it's very responsive. Brushes are very responsive tools for drawing. This is a 19th century Japanese artist, Hokusai. Um, Katsushika Hokusai, I guess is his full name. And he was a skilled and prolific draftsman. And he created over 13,000 prints and drawings during his lifetime. And he's, um, this is called tuning the samisen. I think I might have, yeah. So he's actually tuning, uh, an instrument here called the samisen. It's from 1820 through 25. Like I said, it's it's pretty small. It's about nine by eight. And the lines that are used are very expressive and elegant, partially because he's using a brush and that really helps him, that medium really helps him in his pursuit of that expressive line. And it was made um, possible because he's able to control the brush as well. Um, and in Asia, they use a lot of brushes for writing and drawing, and they're ideal for making calligraphic lines as well. And they hold a substantial amount of ink and readily produce lines that are thick and thin under varying pressure. So they're very responsive, and you can do a lot with them. And he played with a lot of uniformity and thin lines in the head and the hands. So if you look here, he's using smaller, thinner lines that are very uniform in, in size especially with the hands and the head and in the instrument as well. But as we get into the folds of the kimono, um, he's using longer brush strokes and we can follow those with our eyes and the line grows thicker and thinner. And it's a lot more expressive and free flowing when we get into the fabric of this um, musician. So liquid media, we're still talking about that. We're gonna talk about William Kentridge, um, he creates drawings and offers them up as basically finished works. They're not studies um, for anything. So his drawing, Lulu, used both wet and dry media over 
pages of an obsolete dictionary, and he thinks that kind of, to him, that represents faded authority. So we'll take a look at that. So artists today create drawings and offer them as finished works because they value the immediacy and spontaneity of drawing. So this is a South African artist, William Kentridge, and he used a combination of wet and dry media over these pages of an old dictionary, basically, that kind of symbolizes faded authority. And it's basically a portrait of the composer Alan Berg, whom the artist really admires. And the pages seem kind of casually slapped together. And this piece is from 2015, so it's relatively new. India ink and charcoal, uh, 22 by 33 inches. So comics and graphic novels, this is another um, area we'll go into. So a comic is basically a sequential art form based on um, a drawing. So some of the first comic-related visual pieces originate from ancient Egyptian murals. So a lot of them dealt with time and the way that they were laid out in registers was very uh, reminiscent of comics. And so, um, and a lot of medieval tapestries as well, and also some print series created in the 1730s are kind of like the precursors to the modern day comic, basically. And featured, there were a lot of times uh, within the last, you know, couple hundred, two, three hundred years, um, they've been in newspapers. So basically as long as newspapers have been around, comics have been there as well. So we'll take a look at Little Nemo in Slumberland by Windsor McKay. And this is from the New York Herald, April 4th, 1906. So it's a fairly early comic from a newspaper. And it's the most imaginative of the early newspaper comics. Uh, it's called Little Nemo in Summerland, and it's kind of narrates the uh, fantastical dreams of a young child. So in this example, you can see the child, here he is, he's in his bed, and he, there's this tuba player, and the more notes that he plays, the longer his tuba gets, and it's going around with every note that he plays. And it's just kind of a, a playful example of an early comic. Um, so really fun to look at. Um, so there's also graphic novels. Let's take a look and see what... Yeah, maybe we can talk about those really quick. There's also graphic novels, and they're basically book-length storylines. So if you... There's, these have been really famous lately, and they've been making them into movies a lot, like with the Marvel comics and stuff. Um, and we'll talk about some graphic novels here. Emily Carroll, she's a graphic ar novel artist, and she creates stories that update ancient horror tales by locating them in kind of contemporary situation. And she also makes works for the internet a lot, and she also posts web comics quite a bit. So she's really updated the medium quite a bit to be kind of more in this century, basically. And in this example, she created the story all along the wall by scanning a pen, pen drawings and loading them into Photoshop for alteration and finishing. So he, she started off with traditional media and then brought it into the computer and added to it. The story is about a girl who finds herself bored at a family holiday party, so she asks to hear a horror story. And we actually access this work by clicking and scrolling instead of turning pages. So um, it's become interactive in a digital realm instead of, um, you know, as an actual book. So it's from 2014, and it's technically a, a web comic, And um, it's kind of cool to look at online. Um, it's something you could definitely look up online. I can see if I can get this to work here. So we can load it here and see. She slept in a dark, dark room just like this one. By the moon. Every night she would scream for her mother. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting, and this is part of it here. This is the part that they have in the book. And then you can actually click here and it'll take you further. So it, it is a very interactive piece, but I think we'll end here and then we will pick up in the next video.